incredible that a gospel opportunity can fit in your hands. It's called an Operation Christmas Child Shock, and it's filled with fun toys, hygiene items, school supplies, and a personal message. But really, it's much more than that. It's a tangible expression of God's love to introduce Jesus Christ. Churches just like this, when they pack shoeboxes, have a significant gospel impact around the world. In the beginning, people from this village, they were hard-hearted to receive the gospel. The turning point was when we distributed gift boxes. I saw a great impact. After the distribution, many of children gave their lives to Jesus and started with the greatest vision. The greatest vision is so unique for because it's the word of God. I've seen Jesus putting hope upon the children. God is doing a great work. I really encourage my fellow ministers and congregants to pack boxes with Operation Christmas Child. It's a great project to be involved in because it just opens doors for people to find out about Jesus. These boxes open kids' hearts to the fact that there's people all over the world that love them, and what it shows them ultimately is that there's a God that loves them. This is one of many shoebox distributions we've been doing on the nation of Kiribati. We have brought tens of thousands of shoebox even though it's August, uh, it's Christmas for these children. Scripture tells us, go throughout all ends of the earth and bring the good news of Jesus Christ to make fishers of men. That's what we've been called to do. And that's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders and knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. Each year, around 11 million gospel opportunities are shared in over 100 countries and more than four million children enroll in the greatest journey and learn to be disciples the gospel is truly going to the ends of the earth your local church is having a massive impact all because of the simple act of packing a shoebox these shoebox gifts create an opportunity for entire congregations to fulfill the Great Commission. With every shoebox you pack, your church is empowering and training churches globally to share the gospel. This is truly the Great Commission in action. Every vaccination brings us closer to getting out with our friends again. Closer to another hug with mum. To doing things we always love. To getting back to a match with my son. Closer to life feeling normal again. The COVID-19 vaccines have the same safety checks as any other vaccine. And will help protect you and the people close to you. Getting vaccinated and following the public health advice is our best way out of this. Every vaccination brings us closer together. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, good to see you all this morning again, and you're all very welcome. And if you're here in person, obviously you're very welcome, but equally if you're online watching via our Facebook church app, or listening later, our CD message, you too are very welcome. Just a very few short announcements to make before I hand over to the Reverend John Hutchinson. And on your behalf, I bid a very warm welcome back again to First Ralph Freeland. Good to see you back, John. 
and we look forward to hearing what the Lord has laid upon your heart for each of us today. So thank you for coming to share with us today, John. Just a few brief and very quick announcements. There will be a prayer meeting this afternoon in the church hall at 3 p.m. to pray for the work of PW. Uh, and again, when we speak of PW, PW will recommence uh, their face-to-face -face contact meetings this Tuesday evening uh, on the 19th in the church hall. Midweek and Wednesday evening will take the form of a prayer meeting, and that commences at 8 p.m. And the speaker next Sunday morning will be uh, Mr. David Allen. Just a reminder too to say that today is the Samaritan's Purse shoebox appeal. There will be a little video later on, which uh, Reverend Hutchinson will introduce. Uh, so just to remind you about that appeal today as well. And it is with sadness and regret that I have to make two announcements this morning. And that is to make you the congregation aware of the passing of Mrs. Bessie Shannon, uh, late of Dromarton Road. And the late Mrs. Shannon's funeral will take place in St. John's Parish Church on Tuesday at 12 noon, followed by committal here in our church graveyard thereafter. The family has asked if anyone wants to pay their respect uh, on the occasion, they can line the route from St. John's to the church here after the service in St. John's. Also, with sadness, I have to announce the passing of Mr. James Henry, late of La Salle's Road. And Mr. Henry's funeral service will take place at the gravesite here at First Rothfrey Island on Tuesday afternoon at 2.30 p.m. So on your behalf, we extend our deepest and sincere sympathy to both the Shannon and Henry families at this very difficult and sad time of loss in each of their respective households. And I hand you over now to uh, John. Again, thank you for the very warm welcome uh, to uh, First Rath Friend. I do trust that God will richly and deeply bless us here today as we do the most significant thing mankind can do. Worship Almighty God. The psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight in him and he will give you from that delight the desires of your heart. We're going to commence our worship of God by singing our opening praise, which is on our overhead, or will be on our overhead. Holy, holy, holy.
Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we come this your day, a day that you have set aside from all others, a day when your people come corporately and we gather and we lift up our voices and our hearts and our minds to worship you, our glorious God. Father, we recognize this morning that you alone are God. You are I am. There was no one, nothing or anything is comparable with you. And so, Father, we recognize the depth of privilege that belongs to us this day as we have afforded this opportunity to come and bow before you and to declare the worship of your great and glorious name. We pray, our Father, that your name will be honored in our presence this day. We pray that we will know your presence, that we'll be deeply sensitive to your presence. We pray, Father, that we will hear from you and we will respond to you. And what you declared to us, Father, we pray that you would grant us grace to live out those commitments we make before you. Father, we recognize that we are weak vessels. We stray often. We fall. We hide away from things. And Father, in our weakness, we pray that you would meet us and grant us grace. Grant us the forgiveness that has come to us through the cross of Calvary. And grant us the grace to live with you, Father. Grant us that grace when we go into work on Monday morning, when we come back home to our families, when we are with our friends, when we are uh, about our communities. Grant us the grace to live for you and declare who you are through our lives and through our living to others. Father, we pray that you will undertake for us this day, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, at this point, we're going to play a DVD, and it's a DVD with regard to the St. Martin's Purse Christmas Child Operation. And uh, I know it says it's a children's thing, but it's more than a children's thing. It's for us adults to join together with our children and afford the opportunity to give to those who are in much more need than perhaps we can even imagine. The DVD. The children are completely overjoyed. It's a real celebration. So many smiles on their faces. Smiles are all over. Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their blessing. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name. That's what this is all about. Operation Christmas Child is about expressing the love of God. It's its wonderful way to enter into the Christmas spirit in its true meaning. Operation Christmas Child has grown hugely over 30 years since it started here in Britain, but now it is a worldwide project. There's millions of shoeboxes all over the world. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders and knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. So the shoebox journey essentially starts from people in their home packing shoeboxes full of essential items like a toothbrush, some school supplies, toys and gifts, hygiene items, so there's a real mix. I love choosing the things to go in a shoebox. I like to think about what a child would enjoy receiving. Father, we commit these boxes to you as they start their journey. It's so encouraging having people coming into the church bringing their boxes. All sorts of people can help with Operation Christmas Child. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. The volunteers lovingly pack and prepare shoeboxes for international shipping. Everybody out there who packs shoeboxes, they are spreading God's love. Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world. And that is only the beginning.
So when the children have got their boxes, they are invited to take part in something called The Greatest Journey. Which is a 12-lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes the greatest journey, they graduate and receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. When the light of the gospel is turned on, it makes everything new. Operation Christmas Child opens doors for people to discover what is the greatest gift of all, the love of God through Jesus. It is impacting children, it is impacting families, it is impacting the world greatly. I really encourage you to pack a shoebox and get involved with Operation Christmas Child. Lots are being changed. All over the world, it's brilliant. Operation Christmas Child starts in, in your own living room. When a person packs the shoe box and pray for the child who's going to get that box. Father, thank you so much for the privilege that you've given us to be able to pack Operation Christmas Child. When we child. pray, God takes your gift, your box, and he begins to navigate it around the world, and it ends up in the hands of a child. And in those prayers, if you pray for that child... God begins to answer those prayers. And every year we see millions of children put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Aquí hay un regalo para ti. Cuando tenía seis años, yo recibí una cajita de My name is Luis Gonzalez. Growing up in Panama was very difficult. I didn't have a dad. Having a single mother wasn't easy either. Living in poverty made my life even harder, and I was begging my mother, please send me to school. When he came to the time that he had to enter the school, I told Luis to pray because he didn't have the necessary supplies. The next day, a friend of mine invited me to the church. They were giving us boxes when I opened my shoebox. All of the school supplies that I needed to go to school was inside the shoebox. That was the first gift I ever received. In Operation Christmas Child, we hear of these miracles happening all around the world. The child that receives the, the pair of orthopedic shoes that he had needed all his life. Or the child that's prayed for some tools for their dad. And they open the box and there's a hammer or, or, or a measuring tape. Uh, the child that has prayed just to know that somebody loves them. And they open a shoe box and there's a note just saying, hey, we love you. Jesus loves you. The most important thing that we could put in a box is prayer. Praying for the dollars want to get your box. The big impact at the end of the day is lives that are changed. Children are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, and that's what it's all about. Let's keep praying. We need your prayers, and the children, the children of the world, we need your prayers. seen on the video with children in a church setting they were laughing they were carrying on I seen one having a good a, a drama thing and I thought to myself can be Presbyterians they're so happy <laughs> but what was making them happy I read about one time and a sentence struck me in the book that I read. It says, everything, all the gifts that we receive from God 
come with someone else's address on it. All the gifts, all the good things, all the fullness, and we have much of it. All that comes to us has someone else's address on it. That's what we're thinking about. God gives not in order that we can hoard and make big stockpiles in the house about what we have. God gives so that we can give and that we can be a blessing to others. One of the things that I think maybe mum and boys and girls could do, you see when you're out shopping with your mum and dad and you see something really, really nice, you could remain mum and dad, shoebox appeal, and we tell you about mum and And so please let us unite together and really think long and hard about giving to ultimately it is the work of the Lord. Someone once said we see very few people going to church today. The only Christ they will ever see because they don't go to church the only Christ they'll ever see is the Christ in you and me. We are a given people for God so loved the world that he gave. We who have received, we are that giving people. So there is these flowers. They're all here at the front of the church. And the shoe boxes, there's some shoe boxes there. So please do feel free to come along and take our flyer. It's very, very informative. It will really help you think through a lot of the things with this uh, shoe box appeal. There are some shoe boxes also at the front. Now we're going to sing the children's hymn, uh, which is Praise Him, Praise Him. It is up on, or coming up on our overhead. Praise Him, Praise Him. Bible reading this morning is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, and we'll commence reading at verse 36 through to the end of the chapter, verse 50. Let us hear the word of God. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Son, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money 
Lucian Moneylander. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he cancelled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who has had the bigger debt cancelled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil in my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is it who even forgives sin? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I will trust God will bless the reading of his word to us here today. As you need our hearts in prayer, let us pray. Father, we come to you in our prayers of intercession. And Father, we come to you because you are a God who invites us to come and lay before you those things that weigh heavy on our hearts, that you are concerned for us, you meet us in our hour of need, you pour out mercy upon us when we feel at times we least expect it or deserve it. But you are the God who is utterly faithful to who you are and to what you are to your people. And so, Father, we bring before you this day, we bring the Zion family and the Henry family. And we pray, Father, for these two families in their hours of need that you would be on to them everything that they need just now, that you would uphold them when they need it most. You would be grace and strength to them, Father, in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their searching questions. We pray that you would hold them and keep them. And we pray, Father, that they would know just now your love and your grace and your peace that passes understanding. Father, we pray for our nation at this time. We pray for the political situation and the the uncertainty that lays almost ahead daily to our politicians. We pray, our Father, that you would grant them wisdom, that you would grant them to see things as you would have us see it, to honour truth, and uprightness. We pray our Father for our, this COVID situation. And Father, there are still many, many people live with uncertainties, live with fear, live with questions that have not been answered. And we pray, Father, in the midst of this pandemic, that we would search for you. That we would know that you hold the answers to a worldwide problem. We pray, our Father, that we will find our resolve and our resilience in you, that no matter what the task we are faced with, we would know with absolute certainty that you are big enough and that you are actually bigger than the task. So grant us grace to have faith in you, to trust you when it is difficult to trust you, to hold on to you when holding on to you seems like the last thing in the world to us. Grant us that grace. Grant us the prayer, Father, that deep-rooted love and grace and peace that we find in you to trust you in every situation. We ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen. I was at a, a midweek on Wednesday night. Uh, it's on discipleship course. It's a discipleship course, and one of the questions was asked: 
Why do we not love Jesus? Or why do we not why do we not openly declare the gospel to others the way we really should? One answer came back because we don't love Jesus the way we should. The Bible text we read this morning is deeply searching and very confronting as it deals with how do we love Christ? It tells of a meeting between Jesus and Simon the Pharisee and a woman of the city who is generally understood to be a prostitute. The prostitute is at the bottom of the respectable and religious pile, while the Pharisee is at the top. She is frowned upon. She is a social outcast. He is morally upright, religiously orthodox. He is devout and is held in high regard, both within the synagogue or the temple and his community. Simon asks Jesus along to his home for a meal. Now, this would have been a social gathering for a meal. And as a guest rabbi, Jesus would have been expected to give a talk on some religious theme after dinner. He was going like an after-dinner speaker as the guest rabbi. Following that would have been debate on what the rabbi had spoke about. But what is telling about this thing between Jesus and the Pharisee is the absence of any customary greeting that would have showed Jesus was made welcome in the home of Simon the Pharisee. There was no traditional kiss of friendship. There was no washing of feet, what was customary in a dusty land. There was no anointing the head with oil. It all showed Simon had a deep disrespect for Jesus. Indeed, Simon had another agenda for Jesus. He wanted to suss him out. He wanted to see if he lived up to his expectation of what a prophet of God would look like. Most of the guests would have clearly seen that Simon had insulted Jesus. And so there was a lively debate was expected to follow Jesus' talk. But what they were not expecting was that a prostitute would come in and sit at the feet of Jesus. She would have to sit in an outer area where the inside guests would have been in the home, spread around the table. She would have been with other uninvited guests sitting in an outside court where the people uninvited could come along and listen and learn from the stimulating conversation that went on within and around the table. Now this prostitute, she breaks all the protocol and comes and sits at the feet of Jesus. She brings a bottle of special oil along with her to be part of her worship of Jesus. Some writers believe that this oil was an expensive perfume that was used as a tool of her trade to woo men when they would smell the perfume coming from her. But she kneels down before Jesus. And she weeps. Tears run down her face, washing the dust and the dirt off the Saviour's feet. She lets her hair down in public. This was an act that should not have happened. It was only uh, you could only let your hair down in the privacy of your husband. Next, she lays Jesus' feet with her hair. She kisses them, and then she takes this precious oil, this perfume, and pours it on the feet of Jesus. And all this woman bows in a deep love and worship of repentance before Jesus. It's not just tears or hair or kisses or perfume she's pouring out upon Jesus. It's herself. It's everything that she is. Her heart, soul, mind and body is laid at the feet of Jesus. Simon sees nothing of this deep hearted worship. He simply looks on in disgust at this immoral woman and what she's doing at the feet of Jesus in his home. And Simon is not only offended by the woman, he is offended that Jesus, for tolerating it, 
This confirms what Simon has been thinking all along. Verse 39. Simon's thought. This proves, text, this proves that Jesus is no prophet. For if God had really sent him, he would have known what kind of woman the, she is. The thought Simon had been harboring all along was that Jesus was not a prophet. A prophet speaks the word of God and looks at Jesus' acceptance of this woman and concludes that he simply cannot be a prophet. Because if he were, he would know what kind of woman this was and God would have nothing to do with her. He simply can't be a prophet. Simon's religion was loveless. It was the cold-hearted religion of a moralist. The God he served had nothing to offer this woman but judgment and condemnation. I am reminded to this point of what Francis Schieffer said. Biblical orthodoxy without compassion is surely the ugliest thing in the world. Please let us hear that today. Biblical orthodoxy without compassion is surely the ugliest thing in the world. Simon was big on morality. He was big on judgment. But he was deeply deficient in love, compassion and forgiveness. His orthodoxy was lovely or was ugly without love and compassion. Simon would have Jesus reject this woman and push her back down the path from which she was repenting. From which she was seeking forgiveness. He would have Jesus love nice and respectable sinners but not prostitutes and not people of the worst type. But Jesus wants Simon to see two things. His loveless religion in respect to this woman and more importantly his loveless religion in respect to him, Jesus. Simon's problem was that he had no sense of needing God's forgiveness. Like this sinful woman, she needed it. And from here, the lesson Simon had to learn was that he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he who is forgiven much, loves much. So to press this truth home and to show how it impacts upon our lives, Jesus tells the same a story. Verse 41. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One man owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. None of them had the money to pay him back, so he cancelled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. Jesus, in fact, says to Simon, Simon, you are absolutely right. This woman loved much, and you loved little. I came as a guest into your home, and you should have supplied water to wash my feet, but you didn't. By contrast, this woman washed my feet with her tears and wiped her my feet with her hair. Simon, you gave me no kiss of greeting, yet this woman has kissed my feet many times and poured expensive perfume on my feet. You brought me into your home, Simon. You insult me, but this woman has done everything for me that you should have done, but you didn't do, and more. So, Simon, why did she show so much love and you show so little? Answer, verse 47, her many sins are forgiven, so she has shown great love. But one who is forgiven little, loves little. In mathematical terms, it was the prostitute who owed the 500 denarii. She was 10 times worse sinner than Simon, who only owed 50. But they were both sinners with a debt, neither of those who could before God the upright good Pharisee had the same problem as the downright bad prostitute they had both incurred a sin that they could not pay they had both sinned against the holy God and what could they offer to appease the justice and the righteousness 
and the anger of a holy God. What would the Pharisee offer? The Pharisee would offer his morality, his relative goodness. He measured up well with others after all. But Simon had little awareness that he was deeply flawed and rebellious against God, that he was a sinner. He could see little or no sin in his own life, and thus he could see no real need for forgiveness. So he was forgiven little. By contrast, everything this immoral woman did at the feet of Jesus was an expression of love at finding the forgiver and his forgiveness. So Jesus says, her many sins are forgiven, so she has shown great love. Because she was forgiven much, she loved much. She wept tears of remorse and joy before the one who loved her and forgave her. But please do not think, do not think that this means that we can only love God deeply if we fall into terrible sin. That's not what the text is teaching us. The issue is not how deeply we fall into sin. The issue is how conscious we are of the sin into which we have fallen and how clearly we see our need for the Savior. When Jesus accepted this woman's worship, he received her. He accepted her. He owned her. He loved her. He forgave her. He did this by taking and absorbing her sin into himself. The hymn writer puts it well. He writes, he took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. Here Jesus was foreshadowing the cross where he took our sins into himself and made them his very own, and paid their debt with his life on the cross of Calvary. The sinner experienced what the judgmental force he could never experience, God's love and God's forgiveness. Yet, I am painfully aware that someone has rightly said, the Pharisee is alive and well. He is with us and he is within us. The Pharisee within is still one of the primary, primary, primary reasons why many Christians show so little love for Christ. Simon, they do not see what great sinners they are. In Luke 18, 9 to 14, Jesus tells a story about two men who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. He stood upright by himself. He stood out apart from everyone else in the temple. He stood upright and he prayed. And he said, I thank you God that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all my income. The Pharisee tithed, he fasted twice a week. As a good upright man, he stood head and shoulders above others, especially that big tackle that they're down in the corner of the temple. The Pharisee could not see his own sin of pride, his own sin of judgmentalism, his own sin of ever pointing the finger everywhere except at himself. He could see his own goodness and everyone else's sin. The lesson we learn from the Pharisee is that when we focus on self, on our list of religious merits and goodnesses and attainments, we are not focusing on God, who he is and what he has done for us at the cross of Calvary. Those whose love for Jesus has run cold and dull from all flamed hearts. We must come to this text often and drink deeply from it. Our passion and our love for Christ reflects how deeply we see our guilt of sin and how deeply we bathe in the sea of God's forgetfulness. A statement, he who has been forgiven little loves little speaks profound truth to us today. Simon could see no real sin in his life 
that needs a saviour to forgive him in any measure almost whatsoever. Therefore, he had little reason to love Jesus. He didn't need Jesus. He wasn't a sinner of any degree, so he didn't need Jesus to forgive him. He didn't need Jesus the forgiver, and that warranted no kill greeting, no washing the Saviour's feet, no anointing his head with oil, whereas this sinful woman poured her whole life out before Jesus in love and devotion. A great sinner needs a great Saviour that arouses much love and sees much duty in the Saviour. But a little sinner, a little sinner needs only a little Saviour who arouses little love and sees little beauty in the Saviour. Where forgiveness is minimal, love is minimal. We will love God to the degree that we recognize the magnitude of our sin and the immensity of his grace to forgive and heal our brokenness through Christ Jesus. John Stott wrote, The cross is a blazing fire at which the flame of our love is kindled. Read that again. The cross is the blazing fire at which the kindle of our love is kindled. But we have to get near enough to it for its sparks to fall upon us. We have to get near enough to the cross for the sparks of love to land on us. Our problem is getting near enough to the cross of Christ that inflames our hearts with love for him. When we tone down sin in our lives, when we tone down our own sin and view it as marginal, we find little compulsion to draw before the cross of Christ. If we sin little, we find a little Christ to look to. We don't find the Christ who gave himself to the cross of Calvary. When we live dull to our own sin, we live dull to the joy and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, the one who forgives our sins. John Newton lived, he was born in 1725, died 1807. We wrote that great hymn, Amazing Grace. John Newton, he was a, an absolute a vile sinner. It was said that if he was walking down the street, respectable woman would walk to the other side of the street to avoid the language he would come off with. He was a slave trader. In 1747, he was caught in a storm off the coast of County Donegal, and in fear of death, he cried out to God to save him. And God put at him in amazing grace. He became an evangelical Anglican minister at the age of 39, and he died at the age of 82. Not long before his death, Newton declared in a sermon. This is what he declared. My memory is almost gone, but I remember two things. That I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great saviour. That's where we warm our hearts with love for Jesus as great sinners going to a great seer. Verse 50, and I'll finish on this. Then Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Please note what this text is saying. Then Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. The woman was not saved because she loved much. She's not saved because she loved much. She is saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, she loved much. The sinner experiences by faith what the religious moralist could never experience. God's forgiveness. God's peace. Much love for the lover much love before being forgiven. 
Let us pray. Father, help us to stand frequently before the cross of Calvary. Help us to know ourselves and in knowing ourselves we will know the greatness of your love as we come seeking your face. Bless your people, we pray, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, we're going to conclude our worship by singing Here is Love, Vast as the Ocean. We'll stand and worship God and sing together Here is Love, Vast as the Ocean. And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen.